Okay, um, can everybody hear me? Uh, so first of all, uh, welcome and thank you also on behalf of the GUAX leadership and community. Uh, it's great to, uh, to see uh, such enthusiasm. Uh, and um, I'm going to sort of switch a little bit uh, the focus. Um, Roy already uh, pointed out that uh, I'm going to talk about Water for the Food Baskets, which is a World Climate Research Program Grand Challenge. And the reason why I'm doing that is, uh, A, I got asked to do it, and B, is um, because it gives you a nice context for why you would do convection permitting modeling and why uh, you have to think more towards the future. Why are you doing this? Not just because you want to have a better model output, but why do you need a better model output? What's your purpose? So uh, with that, um, we're going to talk, or I'm going to talk, uh, hopefully you also a little bit, um, about the water for food baskets and a little bit about the Index, Index Regional Hydroclimate Project. Um, <clears throat> so why would we talk about food um, and water. The challenges for food production, uh, most of you probably are familiar with it, um, is that we are increasing our food production, but we're not increasing it rapidly enough. And the increase is actually slowing down. So since the 70s, 60s, 70s, we really have been wrapping up, really increasing our food production. But now, the last probably 15, 20 years, it's actually been slowing. While the food, the human population has still been increasing. So that's an issue. Um, <clears throat> so that's one part. So why would you then also look at food? Well, if you're looking at the agriculture systems, that's the place where most of the water is being used. So when we're looking at water scarcity issues, etc., it's not just readily available fresh water for drinking, but if you're looking at who and where it's being used mostly, it's in the agriculture. Um, so if you want to change the effects of climate change, and want to see the impact, and want to have a better idea of what's going to happen, we need to sort of have a better handle on uh, food production and how our climate is changing and how the change in water availability in the various regions is going to affect that. That's one point uh, from a sort of physical point of view. The other one is, how are humans really going to react to that? How is our influence on the water system going to change? Uh, we can have already lots of discussions this year in California, for instance, or on, on the East Coast with all the rain that's been falling this year. Uh, what is happening? How do we react to it? And uh, we will see um, changes. So <clears throat> our knowledge on the water cycle is essentially of a system perceived as natural. That's sort of state. That's how we've been trained. Um, and of course, that's not true. Um, because humans are really, really uh, imp uh, impacting the water cycle and the way water is moving through our system. So, um, how do we capture that? And how, do well, how well do we know the processes that govern, for instance, the slow reservoirs? Groundwater, uh, snow, glaciers. And in particular, when we think about groundwater, uh, we need to sort of have a better handle there too on, OK, how is it changing? How, how are they recharging? Uh, why are they recharging? Um, climate change will also perturb the real system, uh, but uh, how relevant is that knowledge with respect to the impacts that the humans are having? So um, are we sort of overestimating the impacts by the natural s forces that are changing versus what the humans are already doing to our water system as a whole? And keep in mind, I'm talking about the water system, not about other things right now. Uh, practices for water resource management are based on past experience. So. Uh, they have involved, uh, but uh, have we taken that into uh, account and have they uh, actually thought about how climate change might impact? And this is one of the areas where, for instance, convection permitting modeling is, is so insightful because it really shows now how things are changing and why it's changing. And uh, I don't think that actually has trickled down into uh, the uh, community of practice. Um, is our science then henceforth relevant for the practitioner? Absolutely. Uh, but we have, to, of course, to make sure that they understand why it's relevant and uh, how it's relevant. And so what do we need to do to make that transfer of knowledge effective? So the WCP Grand Challenge on water availability um, assumes that water cycle is a main driver for food production. Um, a warmer climate pushes the water cycle into unknown territory for us geophysicists, that is. The terrestrial water cycle is not natural anymore. And there is an urgency to understand the new state of that water cycle in which both natural and anthropogenic uh, processes interact. 
So what do we need to do? Well, observations, of course, are important. Uh, we should uh, look at regions of agriculture and actually have much better observations than we currently have, better quantify the human control on the water cycle, uh, process studies on surface atmosphere interactions, and promote interdisciplinary analysis. In particular, when we're looking at observations, uh, we always say we want better, we want more. That's easy. Uh, the question is, okay, how are we effective in that? What is it that we actually need? And where do we need these observations to actually test our models and sort of uh, transfer that knowledge to other regions? Enhancing predictive capabilities. Propose model intercomparisons to promote model, pr promote model development. Revisit the past evolution which combined climate change and increasing human intervention and consolidate process knowledge in our models. So, the latter aspect really sort of alludes to uh, what Roy and myself in particular have been pushing lately is the link to the agricultural community. So, how do we interact with the models that actually forecast food production? What do they need to know? And how can we interact? What are the scales of relevance to them uh, versus what are the scales of relevance to us? And how do we make sure that we interface right and do things together? Uh, this is the, the nice little graph that uh, is not showing what it should show. Uh, I'm not sure if this thing works. It does. Uh, so uh, within GUX, we have what we call regional hydroclimate projects. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but it's one way that we try to have scientists collaborate. I mean, GUX is all about stimulating science collaboration in an international uh, setting. Uh, so what we try to do is have scientists work together on a specific region with a specific uh, topic. So we have uh, some known ones, like the Global Water Futures one in, in Canada. Um, Baltic Earth, which used to be Baltex in, in the North, uh, North Europe, around the Baltic Sea. Um, HIMAX, around the Mediterranean. Uh, we had uh, a couple in the past uh, called uh, GAME, for instance, in Asia. Um, MAGS, the Mackenzie River GWAC studies in, in Canada. Um, GSIP in, uh, in the US, uh, and um, so we're looking now at, at how do we use these regional hydroclimate projects to A, have scientists collaborate, and B, also to transfer knowledge, and in this case, how do we use these to actually help uh, this workshop, this, this topic, in moving it forward in, in other regions. And hence, I'm going to talk a little bit about Andex for two reasons. One of them is that we don't have a current regional hydroclimate project in Latin America, uh, so we try to sort of even out things, and we're looking at it, okay, what is an interesting region? Uh, so secondly, um, for us, it's also a way to promote science in the region. So it's not just that we like to go to Latin America and say, no, it's actually the opposite. It's not that we go to Latin America, it's actually the Latin American scientists that need to do that work. Uh, so uh, we talked to a couple of them uh, to say, hey, what would be interesting in this region and, and what are the, the, uh, the main topics um, you guys want to tackle? Um, the Andex uh, Andean experiment focuses on the Andean region, and I'll, uh, we'll go in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, the background for the water for food baskets came actually from another basin, which is the Pannonian Basin. I'm not sure if anybody of you have heard of it, unless you've heard my talk before. Uh, but um, one day came up a couple of years ago with the Pannonian Basin. I'm like, where the heck is that? Um, apparently it was in Europe. Um, so um, <clears throat> this is northern uh, Croatia. Um, somewhere here is Austria. Hungary is around here. Um, so the the new river uh, is going. Uh, I always forget how that thing is streaming exactly through it. Uh, I think it's going actually like this. Um, and this whole area used to be the grain producing uh, area in Europe, and, and it's surrounded by mountains. And it was really an interesting uh, area. Uh, we talked about it because of atmospheric stability, because it was this, this huge area surrounded by mountains, and a lot of times there was fog covering the region, this very stable atmosphere. And we sort of started ch chatting about it at this uh, GeoX steering group meeting, and we said, okay, well, what's going on? They said, oh yeah, well, it was a food producing region. I said, oh, why don't we look into that? For two reasons. One of them, because of the physics involved, but secondly, because we also, again, wanted to have the community in Eastern Europe 
be involved and rally about it around a topic that's of use. So hence, uh, the Pannonian Basin um, <coughs> came to be, and we have now uh, Panex, uh, which is looking at uh, basically water availability in this region under climate change, and um, this is one of the uh, our um, newer uh, regional hydroclimate projects. <coughs> another one uh, that we really would like to start is uh, another one in the U.S. Um, we've been pushing for that one for a while now. Um, um, Roy sort of said, well, the Rocky Mountains, western U.S. and Canada might be an interesting uh, uh, area. Um, <coughs> ultimately, regardless what comes out of it, I think uh, what is really interesting here is uh, what needs to be done. What is it that we really want to do? And uh, I think uh, for most of the regional hydroclimate projects, uh, it's sort of a nice summary here. We want to have coordinated multi-scale field experiments and remote sensing campaigns to quantify uh, the various uh, processes at the various scales, uh, to understand these key processes, and to make a compilation of data to test our various model hypotheses. And then, of course, model synthesis, new controlled into comparisons and, and model improvements uh, of uh, the physics parameterization uh, and how that uh, will affect uh, our models. So one, uh, <coughs> I'm going to quickly go over it because you guys are going to talk much more and know much more about it than I do. Uh, so one of the reasons why we want to do this is because we now are able to reproduce much better uh, uh, the precipitation at, uh, at higher resolutions. However, precipitation is not the only thing uh, why we're looking at uh, convecting permitting models. And um, <coughs> climate available water, precipitation minus evaporation, is really what we're interested in. And uh, if you're looking at where the big unknown is also, it's not just in precipitation, it's also in evaporation, evapotranspiration. So uh, when we really want to go to higher resolution models, we also have an opportunity to actually do our evapotranspiration and the land surface interactions much better. Uh, so that's very important. Um, it's also a push actually for us to link better to the communities that deal with uh, vegetation, uh, and in particular uh, the uh, agricultural uh, modeling community. Um, <clears throat> what also is, is important is that uh, plenty of evidence that subsurface atmosphere interactions occur at smaller scales and of course will not be credible on, on until we actually use convection permission, permitting models, uh, but also uh, we should not just uh, limit ourselves to atmospheric processes. It also happens at surface and subsurface processes. So what is scarcity in Latin America? So one of the reasons that uh, we were looking at uh, in the Andean region is how stable is that region uh, under, f under change, under climate change, and how could it change, and what are the needs uh, that it needs to be adapted to, and what can be mitigated. And I'm formulating these questions in a way that if you think about things like wine, so vineyards, there's already a tendency in Chile and Argentina to move the vineyards up the slope. It's already happening. So climate change is already affecting actively, clearly, how agriculture is being done. We also know that the coffee bans, two of my favorite drinks, by the way, um, <coughs> um, is narrowing. So you know, we really need to look at that because you know, if you're really interested in wine, if you really like coffee, you know, this is this is where we need to make an impact. Uh, but this is changing. The, the bands is narrowing, and hence, you know, in these regions where these are really the cash crops. It's important to, to make sure that we have a better handle on, on how it's going to change and what we can do uh, to, to mitigate some of these things and what agricultural community needs to do to sort of prevent that, you know, in some time they can't grow coffee anymore in that region. Um, so um, <clears throat> a lot of people working on it. But if you just step back and say, okay, what does it mean for food production? Similarly, uh, the Andean region, when you're looking at, at how drastically of short distances, the water availability changes, and how that is changing in general, uh, we need to just have a much better handle on it. Like we know how, for instance, the um, moisture flow from the Pacific affects the US, the, Paci the Pacific Northwest. We don't have that good of a handle in Latin America how that affects things. So this is one reason why we're looking at, uh, at uh, Latin America. 
Uh, the other one is um, <clears throat> we have uh, some groups that are already working there on agriculture modeling, and uh, this sort of helps us in, in establishing that link further. The human dimension has many aspects. Um, I mentioned a few, uh, the way we control water, the way we handle water, uh, but also the way we handle our land surfaces. That also affects water. Um, the link between water and agriculture is highly nonlinear, so we really need to find a way to deal with that. And it's much more than irrigation and groundwater extraction and, and reservoir management. It's really very, very complex. It has a huge socioeconomic aspect to it, which is something we don't do, but we have to be aware of when we're looking at modeling this type of stuff that we can only do so much. When we're looking at past, it's probably much easier. When we go into forecasting modes, it's going to be very complicated because we humans are going to react to socioeconomic factors much more than we are going to the geophysical changes. So, expected outcome of the grand challenge. Progress in land surface modeling with the explicit, explicit representation of water measurement, water management. Enhance our knowledge of surface atmosphere interactions in managed environments. Build the capacity to predict the real system, at least at regional scale for weather forecasting as well as climate research. Develop our capabilities to predict the water and nutrient fluxes, fluxes to the oceans, as well as make climate science more relevant to hydrological and agronomics, economic sciences in terms of processes and scales considered. Um, this is one slide that goes well in general when we talk to things like the Joint Scientific Committee and stuff to explain why we do it and why it's relevant, the Sustainable Development Goals. So we picked a couple that uh, it's highly relevant for, but water, of course, is, is such a crucial thing in many aspects of many things that um, many of the Sustainable Development Goals are related to it. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I think I have plenty of time left uh, to make sure that the other speakers have time to talk as well. Thank you so much.